like to invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 as we begin our study today. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. This verse is a very important verse for our Christian experience as it talks to us about our journey to the kingdom of God. It says here that we are to go on unto perfection. We are never to rest satisfied with the attainments that we have made, but we must go onward and upward into the kingdom of God. If we do not do this, there are problems that we will face on our Christian journey. I would like to read from Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 123 to 124. Volume 2, Testimonies for the Church, page 123 to 124. It says, The Spirit, wisdom, and goodness of God revealed in His Word are to be exemplified by the disciples of Christ and are thus to condemn the world. Now notice here, what is going to condemn the world? It is not going to be the preaching of the Word of God merely, but it says here that it is when the Spirit, wisdom, and goodness of God, as revealed in His Word, is to be exemplified by the disciples of Christ. In other words, when we are living up to what is written in this Word, this is what is going to condemn the world. For this reason, it goes on, God requires of His people according to the grace and truth given them. God expects from you and me, not simply what we had in the very beginning, but as each day we grow, God expects from us according to our growth. It is like a little child. When you have a little baby, you do not expect things from a baby that you expect from a 10-year-old. And likewise, you do not expect from a 10-year-old what you expect from a 20-year-old. As a person grows, your expectations increase. And it's the same way here with God. It says, God requires of His people according to the grace and truth given them. All His righteous demands must be fully met. Accountable beings must walk in the light that shines upon them. If they fail to do this, their light becomes darkness, and their darkness is great in the same degree as their light was abundant. Now, notice this very important thought here, that when we are increasing in our light, in our Christian pathway, God is revealing more and more light to us. And as we are increasing in that light, if we continue going on into perfection, the Lord is blessing us. But what happens when we begin to backslide? What happens when we apostatize? Now, if we apostatize, if we go back on the truth that God has given to us, we do not merely fall down to the same degree that we had begun. Oh, no. To the degree, to the extent that we had received light, to that same extent do we fall back down. And this is why it's important for us not to fall because we'll fall lower than we began. God wants us to go on upward unto perfection. It goes on, Accumulated light has shone upon God's people, but many have neglected to follow the light, and for this reason they're in a state of great spiritual weakness. We become spiritually weak when we do not follow in the light that we have. Sometimes we feel spiritually weak and we think, oh, maybe I need some music to get me going. Maybe I need some, some uh, spiritual uh, camp meeting or something. Yes, those may be helpful to us. But the real problem is that we are not following the light that God has given to us. If we follow in the light that God gives us, we're going to have that heavenly joy that God intends for His people to have. Furthermore, we often think that people are destroyed because they do not know. We often quote the passage that says, people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Unfortunately, 
many times we do not read the entire verse or sometimes our memory only remembers a part of a verse. And this is the problem in this particular case. Let's look at Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 identifies the real nature of the problem. It is not because of lack of knowledge, but let's take a look at it. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Notice the passage here. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but it does not stop there. It says, Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. So the problem here does not lie in re not having knowledge. The problem lies in receiving knowledge and then rejecting it. So we continue the statement again from volume 2, page 123 to 124. It is not for lack of knowledge that God's people are now perishing. No, but what? They will not be condemned because they do not know the way, the truth, and the life. The truth that has reached their understanding. The light that has shone on the soul, but which has been neglected or refused, will condemn them. Those who never have the light to reject will not be in condemnation. What more could have been done for God's vineyard than has been done? So you see, people will not be destroyed because they do not know. People will be destroyed because they heard the truth and then rejected the truth. So how can then the truth save me? How can I be benefited by the truth? Well, there are three things that must happen. The statement goes on, light, precious light shines upon God's people, but it will not save them unless... Now, this unless is very important. There are three things listed here that show what will, how will the truth be able to save us. So let us take a look at those three things. In the first place, Light, precious light shines upon God's people, but it will not save them unless they consent to be saved by it. So, truth will never save us unless we, number one, agree to be saved by that truth. If I do not agree with the truth, it can never save me. How many times I had a study with somebody and... They would listen to the whole presentation. They would not know that anything is... They would, they would tell me there's nothing wrong with your presentation, but they never came to the point of actually agreeing with that truth. And therefore, it can never save them. So number one, we must agree to be saved by it. Then number two, we must fully live up to it. So, number one, we must agree to it, but that's not enough. Number two, then, we must fully live up to the truth that we have. If we do not fully live up to it, it will not save us. And then, number three, we must transmit it to others. So, number one, we must agree with the truth. That's the first thing. Number two, we must fully live up to it. And number three, we must transmit it to others. Transmitting it to others without fully living up to it is actually destructive. So, these are the three things that must happen in order for the light to save us. I want to read this sentence once again in its context. It says, Light, precious light shines upon God's people, but it will not save them unless they consent to be saved by it, fully live up to it, and transmit it to others in darkness. God calls upon His people to act. It is an individual work of confessing and forsaking sins and returning unto the Lord it is needed. One cannot do this work for another. Religious knowledge has accumulated and this has increased corresponding obligations. Great light has been shining upon the church and by it they are condemned because they refuse to walk in it. If they were blind, they would be without sin. But they have seen light and have heard much truth, yet are not wise and holy. Many have for years made no advancement in knowledge and true holiness. They are spiritual dwarfs. 
instead of going forward to perfection, they are going back to the darkness and bondage of Egypt. Their minds are not exercised into godliness and true holiness. So keep in mind once again, as we just looked earlier, we saw that there was the road to perfection. You remember, we were going on the way, and that journey upward was on the road to perfection. Now, if we are not going on the road to perfection, where are we going? It said, back down to the darkness of Egypt. So, either we are going forward unto perfection, or we're going back to Egypt. So, when it says there in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, let us go on unto perfection, it means let us leave Egypt and go to the perfection that God has in store for us. Now, in this understanding of our process of going to perfection in contrast to going back down to Egypt. I want us to read Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It says here that whatsoever things written aforetime were written for our learning. Now, it is talking here about not reading everything that came down the line. You know, Satan inspired many writers, and it doesn't mean that we are to write, read all of them. But it says here that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So whatsoever things were written aforetime in the Scriptures were written for our learning. And it is as we learn the lessons given to us in the Scriptures, in the whatsoever. Now, how much is whatsoever? Well, whatsoever means everything. So every part of the Scriptures was given by God to teach us, to educate us. And only as we are learning those lessons are we going to get the benefit that God desires us to have from the Word of God. Now, in the book Education, page 191, Education, page 191, is a very important paragraph, again, telling us about how important every part of Scripture is. It says, Every part of the Bible is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Old Testament, no less than the New, should receive attention. As we study the Old Testament, we shall find living springs bubbling up where the careless reader discerns only a desert. So, if you are reading something in the Bible and you think, oh, this is boring, well, then according to the statement, you are called a careless reader because the careless reader only finds a desert. But if you are searching the Scriptures uh, with the in understanding that every part is important, you're going to find living springs bubbling up if you search for them. Now, there are many histories in the Bible that are important. But I would like to emphasize one particular part of the history of the Old Testament for our time. We read this about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Now let us read these verses. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and into the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. In these verses, I would like to emphasize verse 11. Because verse 11 is a key for us understanding the reasons for the experience of the children of Israel in their wilderness sojourn. Verse 11 says, Now all these things, again, speaking about their sojourn from Egypt to Canaan, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. Now what's an ensample? Now, Many times we think, we misread it, we think it's just an example. It is true, it is an example, but it's something more specific. If you look at your marginal reading to explain the original text a little bit clearer, it says a type. In other words, the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness was a type of the experience of God's people when... Notice, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things in the wilderness wanderings were specifically written as a type of those upon whom the end of the world will come. Now who is that? Do we believe we're living in the time of the end? Do we believe that we're living in the time when the world is going to come to its conclusion? Well, if so, then this is written for us. Then there are specific lessons written in the experience of the children of Israel on their journey from Egypt to Canaan that are lessons for us in our time. Especially as we think of their experience in relationship to where we are going as far as a people of God. We are also traveling in a journey And we are journeying where? We are looking for heavenly Canaan. We are headed for the heavenly Canaan. Now, I want to read a statement in regard to that. Prophets and Kings, page 715. Prophets and Kings, 715. As the captive exiles heeded the message, flee out of the midst of Babylon. This is speaking uh, at the time of the Babylonian captivity. And were restored to the land of promise. So those who fear God today are heeding the message to withdraw from spiritual Babylon. And soon they are to stand as trophies of divine grace in the earth made new, the heavenly Canaan. So what is the heavenly Canaan? It is actually the earth made new. So the new earth is actually the heavenly Canaan that we are looking forward to. And later on in some of our studies, we're going to cover a little bit more about this earth made new being the real Canaan. So we are headed to heavenly Canaan, the earth made new. And so what is Satan trying to do? Because we, as God's people, are going to that heavenly kingdom. What is Satan trying to do? Again, uh, this time, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 688 to 689. Patriarchs and Prophets, 688 to 689. It says, Satan was determined to keep his hold on the land of Canaan. And when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted their destruction. Through the agency of evil spirits, strange gods were introduced. And because of transgression, the chosen people were finally scattered from the land of promise. This history, Satan is striving to repeat in our day. That's right. Satan wants to repeat that same history today. God is leading His people out from the abominations of the world that they may keep His law. And because of this, the rage of the accuser of our brethren knows no bounds. The devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The antitypical land of promise is just before us. And Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. The admonition, watch ye and pray lest ye enter the temptation, was never more needed than now. So as we are about to enter into the heavenly Canaan, Satan is doing what? He is 
God redoubling his efforts to keep us from entering that into typical land of promise. You may remember the experience of the children of Israel. When they left Egypt, there was over 603,000 men, 20 years old and upward, that left Egypt on their journey to the promised land. Of those 603,000, how many of them entered that promised land? We take a look at Numbers chapter 26. Numbers chapter 26, verses 64 and 65. After they went ahead and numbered the people again as they were about to enter the promised land, it says, But among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Only two left. I wonder... What percentage is that? Of those that left Egypt, when they left Egypt and they entered into the promised land, how many were left? Two out of 603,000. It's interesting if you take a look at that, just a, a little bit percentage-wise, 10% is 60,000. 300. 1% would be 6,030. Look at that. That's 1% would be 6,000 equals 1%. But only two came out of all of that. That is a tragedy. That was a big tragedy that took place back in those days. And yet, that same tragedy is taking place today. Satan wants to repeat this experience. For that reason, in volume 1, Testament for the Church, page 284, volume 1, page 284, it says, The experience of Christians in these days is much like the travels of ancient Israel. Please read 1 Corinthians 10, especially from the 6th to the 15th verse. So we are advised to read that experience. Now, why are we to read that particular experience? Why are we to learn those lessons, especially for those of us living in these last days, as we're about to enter the heavenly Canaan? Well, if we are going to heavenly Canaan, we must also have left Egypt, because it says there, we are either going on to perfection, or we are going where? Down to the darkness of Egypt. So tell me something. When did we, as an Adventist people, as an Advent body, when did we depart from Egypt? Great Controversy, page 457 to 458. Great Controversy, page 457 to 458. God led His people in the Advent movement, even as He led the children of Israel from Egypt. In the Great Disappointment, their faith was tested as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. So, when we talk about the Red Sea, it was similar to the Great Disappointment. And when was the Great Disappointment? This was 1844. So we, as an Adventist body, we left Egypt as a people in the year 1844. And therefore, in this time period, since 1844, we are in the wilderness. We often complain about the people of Israel. They spent how long in the wilderness? They spent 40 years in that wilderness. And what about us today? What about we as a people of God? How long have we as an Adventist people been laying here in the wilderness going back to and fro? Not 40 years, not even 140, but over 150 years already. And by the time you're watching this video, I don't know how long. Brethren, there must be some important lessons for us to learn because it's high time for us to go up and possess the land.
God wants us to be Joshua's and Caleb's. God wants us to go up. Of course, we know that most of our, all of our forefathers from back then have died already. But it is up to us now. What are we doing as the children of those forefathers? Are we repeating the same history? Or shall we go up and possess the land? Continuing on, in the great disappointment, their faith was tested as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Had they still trusted to the guiding hand that had been with them in the past experience, they would have seen the salvation of God. They would have seen it. In 1844, they would have seen the salvation of God. All who had labored, if all who had labored unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, that could have happened. We didn't have to be here for 150 years. But here we are, over 150 years later. But it is time for us not to learn history or study history merely to point the finger and say, oh, they did not make it. That is not the purpose of this study. If you, and that's not the purpose of this whole video series. If you want to go pointing fingers, go somewhere else. What we need to learn is lessons to apply them to you and me personally. That is the purpose of these studies. It goes on, it was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He desired to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, a holy, happy people. They could have entered in. Actually, they were right at the border of the promised land within around two years. Can you believe that? They did not need to spend 40 years. Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert. And others were raised up to enter the promised land. Oh, what happened? They perished and someone else was raised up to enter that promised land. In like manner, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed and His people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow. That was not God's plan. But what? Why are we here? But unbelief separated them from God. As they refused to do the work which He had appointed them, others were raised up to proclaim the message. In mercy to the world, Jesus delays His coming, that sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find in Him a shelter before the wrath of God shall be poured out. When they were there in the wilderness sojourn, when they refused to enter the promised land, they were buried in that wilderness. And what happened? And others were raised up and they entered in. I have a question. Do you want someone else to take your place? Is that what you desire? Or do you desire to enter the promised land? It depends upon your decisions. They entered not in because of unbelief. In the Advent Movement of 1844, their message was based on time. Remember the Great Disappointment. Now, sometimes we may think that, oh, maybe we need something like that today. Maybe we need a message about time, a specific time that we can be encouraged, that we can decide to take decided efforts to do the will of God. In early writings on page 75, we read the following. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. That's right. It has nothing to do with life. It must not be hung up on time. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it, and that it will go in mighty power to do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. We do not need another message regarding time. There are these issues about time are only sidetracks.
It is to draw us away from the journey. Anytime you hear a message on time today, it is to draw us off the path. There is no message of time for these last days. Rather than that, we have the third angel's message to be proclaimed and it will lead us clearly to the promised land. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let us go back to those verses again. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to read verse 6. It is because of these things, because many have failed in the wilderness back in the days of Israel, and they could not enter the promised land, that, and their experience was a type of the experience of God's people today in these last days. For that reason, we read verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent. We should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, those things that, that they fell off for, what are they called? What are those things called? Whenever there was a sidetrack that took them down, that we're not to lust at, what is it called? It is called lust. What do we mean by lust? Let us read Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. What is lust? It is covet. It is covetousness. In other words, it is the violation of the 10th, Commandment. What's another word for all of this? It is sin. That's right. So when we study the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness, back in their time, we will know that those things that they lusted after are sin for them. And to those of us who have crossed the Red Sea in 1844, and we are headed to the promised land. What are those things called today? They are called equally. They are called sin. Therefore, we are not to lust after those evil things. Now, I want to just change a little, seemingly a, a little topic here for a moment. Because there's another very important lesson for us. Because throughout all that wilderness wandering, as they were deceived on one place or another place, it didn't matter. Satan had a deception for someone somewhere. If you did not follow on one point, he had another one for you. And today he does the same thing. You may think to yourself, oh, I'm strong. I will never fall for that. Maybe you never will. But there may be another point that Satan has for you. So what is our security? And furthermore, another very important question. Today, we have a similar problem as in the wilderness wanderings. You had the leaders, Moses, Aaron, they were leading out the people of God. And there were other leaders along the way. And each time when there was an apostasy, there was someone leading out in that apostasy. Now, how do you know which one to follow? How do you know when, which one was right, which one was wrong? One time, even Aaron and Miriam rebelled. How do you know who was right? Well, you know, God did something very simple. The God that we worship has made it so easy for us to understand the plan of salvation that when we are lost, and if we, stand, if we are lost, I should say, because I don't want us to be when we are lost. I want each of us to be saved. But if we are lost, we will, when the judgment comes, we will clearly know the reason. Because God made it simple for us to understand the plan of redemption. And that simple way in the wilderness wandering is recorded here in Volume 2, Bible Commentary, page 994. Volume 2, Bible Commentary, page 994. It says, Study carefully the experience of Israel in their travels to Canaan. Study the third and fourth chapters of Joshua, recording their preparation for and passage over the Jordan into the Promised Land. We need to keep the heart and mind in training by refreshing the memory with the lessons that the Lord taught His ancient people. Then to us, 
as he designed it should be to them, the teachings of his word will ever be interesting and impressive. So we want to know how to enter the heavenly Canaan today. We have important lessons to learn from the experience of the children of Israel as they cross the Jordan River. Do you want to cross the Jordan? Do you want to go up and possess the land? I know I do. Therefore, it says that there are important lessons here as we study the third and fourth chapters of Joshua. Now, we're only going to read chapter 3. So we like to turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. And I want you to pay attention very clearly here on, on how God made it so simple for His people to follow the right leadership, to follow the right message into the promised land. Let us read verses 1 through 17. And I will make some emphasis as we go along. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. So when you see the ark of God, then you get up and you follow it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way hitherfore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you unto Jordan. Now, therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, ev out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the Lord. And as they bear the Ark, were coming to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the waters, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. How did God plan for the children of Israel to cross over the Jordan River? How? It was very simple. It was watch the ark. When the ark moved, then you move, and you follow the ark. Now imagine, if instead of waiting for the ark, you ran ahead of the ark, what would happen to you? Yes, it would drown, because it was flood stage for the Jordan River. I don't know if you have seen rivers in the flood stage. You may find even a little creek, and it looks like a very harmless creek, harmless river, you can swim in that river, but when it becomes flood stage, it is dangerous and many lives are lost by people going into the river when it is in flood stage. So what would happen if you went ahead of the ark? You'd be drowned. What happens if you went to the side of the ark? 
you'd be drowned. And what happens if you decide to wait? Ah, not right now. I'm not in a hurry right now. Everyone can go ahead of me first. And once they go ahead, then I will follow afterwards eventually. And the ark gets on the other side. What then? Then again, you have a problem. The only safety is to follow the ark. So it is for us today. Is there a lesson on this? Is there something important for us as a people to follow the ark to the heavenly Canaan? To cross the Jordan River? Oh, we'll find that out in a little while. Now, first of all, what was in the ark that was very important? Now, most of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. They were placed inside the ark. Most pictures that I have seen always have shown the Ten Commandments in the ark. But what did God give us to help us to keep the Ten Commandments? Let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. What did God give them? What did God give them in order to help them to keep the commandments of God? It says here He gave them statutes and judgments. Now, what were these statutes and judgments? In Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, 264, 265. Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, 264, 265. It says, He then came still closer to His people who were so readily led astray and would not leave them with merely the ten precepts of the Decalogue. He commanded Moses to write as he should bid him, judgments and laws giving minute directions in regard to what he required them to perform, and thereby guarded the ten precepts which he had engraved upon the table of stone. So God gave them what? Statutes and judgments for what purpose? To guard the ten precepts. To guard the ten commandments. And it says these were giving minute directions in regard to these ten commandments. These specific directions and requirements were given to draw erring man to the obedience of the moral law which he is so prone to transgress. Now this next paragraph I found quite interesting. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved in the ark by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. Circumcision would have been totally unnecessary if they kept the law of God to begin with. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a token or pledge, they would never have gone into idolatry nor been suffered to go down into Egypt. And there would have been no necessity of God's proclaiming His law from Sinai and engraving it upon tables of stone and guarding it by definite directions in the judgments and statutes given to Moses. God never had planned for Israel to go into Egypt. That was totally unnecessary. It was because they rejected the law of God that they were led down into Egypt. And then, when they came out of Egypt, if they would have kept the law, there would be no, no necessity for proclaiming the law from the Mount Sinai. And furthermore, it was totally unnecessary to give all those specific directions. But because people were blind, that God gave them these things to help them. You see, God gives us more instruction, not that He is adding more to it, but they were always there. If we kept them to begin with, he wouldn't have to write them down to be specific. We go on. Moses wrote these judgments and statutes from the mouth of God while he was with him in the mount. If the people of God had obeyed the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the specific directions given to Moses, which he wrote in the book relative to their duty to God and to one another. The definite directions which the Lord gave to Moses in regard to the duty of the people to one another and to the stranger are the principles of the Ten Commandments simplified and given in a definite manner that they need not err. So what were the statutes there? They were simply the principles of the Ten Commandments made in such a simple manner that no one needs to make a mistake. That is the plan of God. 
That was the plan of God for you and me. In early writings, page 52, we won't read it now, but it tells us there that these, this statute book was continually enlarged until we found it to be the whole Bible. So you see, the whole Bible is the statute book. The whole Bible, the entire thing. So this kept being simplified and made more simplified and more simplified until finally we got this whole Bible. And today it's been more simplified. We have the spirit of prophecy as well. Can you believe that? God loves us so much. He wants to make the plan of salvation so simple, so clear. If you and I want to follow the Lord, if you and I want to enter the promised land, we need to learn about these statutes and judgments. In Volume 1, Testament for the Church, page 332 to 333, it says, God is now testing and proving His people. Character is being developed. Angels are weighing moral worth and keeping a faithful record of all the acts of the children of men. Among God's professed people are corrupt hearts, but they will be tested and proved. That God who reads the hearts of everyone will bring to light hidden things of darkness where they are often least suspected. That stumbling blocks which have hindered the progress of truth may be removed. And God have a clean and holy people to declare His statutes and judgments. What does God want in these last days? He wants a clean and holy people to declare His statutes and His judgments. For that reason we look at Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. Malachi 4 and verse 4. The book of Malachi lists many important things for us in these last days. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. So what are we to remember? The law of God, but also together with what? With the statutes and with the judgments. Continuing from volume 1, 333. It says, God will have a clean and holy people to declare His statutes and judgments. The next paragraph. The captain of our salvation leads His people on step by step, purifying and fitting them for translation, and leaving in the rear those who are disposed to draw from the body, who are not willing to be led, and are satisfied with their own righteousness. So one group is going on the translation, and the other is being left behind. Now, there are some examples of statutes. In Review and Herald, May 6, 1875, Review and Herald, May 6, 1875, it gives us a summary of some of the statutes. The law of types reached forward to Christ. All hope and faith centered in Christ until type reached its antitype in his death. The statutes and judgments specifying the duty of man to his fellow man were full of important instructions defining and simplifying the principles of the moral law for the purpose of increasing religious knowledge and of preserving God's chosen people distinct and separate from idolatrous nations. The statutes concerning marriage, inheritance, and strict justice and deal with one another were peculiar and contrary to the customs and manners of other nations and were designed of God to keep His people separate from other nations. The necessity of this to preserve the people of God from becoming like the nations who had not the love and fear of God is the same in this corrupt age when the transgression of God's law prevails and idolatry exists to a fearful extent. If ancient Israel needed such security, we need it more to keep us from being utterly confounded with the transgressors of God's law. The hearts of men are so prone to depart from God that there is a necessity for His strength and discipline. So these statutes and judgments, among them include marriage, inheritance, strictly dealing with one another. There are several things that involved in these statutes. But we must be careful what these statutes are and what these statutes are not. Again, in Review and Herald, the same article, May 6, 1875. 
It says, God gave a clear and definite knowledge of His will to Israel by His special precepts, showing the duty of man to God and to his fellow man. The worship due to God was clearly defined. A special system of rites and ceremonies was established, which would secure the remembrance of God among His people, and thereby serve as a hedge to guard and protect the Ten Commandments from violation. So these things were there to guard the Ten Commandments from being violated. God's people, whom He calls His peculiar treasure, were privileged with a two-fold system of law, the moral and ceremonial. We need to understand this clearly. There was a two-fold system of law among the Hebrew people. There was the moral law, and there was a ceremonial. These were a twofold system of law. Let me start again. God's people, whom He calls His peculiar treasure, were privileged with a twofold system of law the moral and the ceremonial. The one pointing back to creation to keep in remembrance the living God who made the world, whose claims are binding upon all men in every dispensation, and which will exist through all time and eternity. So, the one law is what? Moral. And it does what? It points back to what? To creation. Right? It points back to creation. And it is going to exist how long? It has no end. It goes on into eternity. It points back to creation. So when we want to know what is a moral law, we look and see what does it point to. Does it point back to creation? Or does it do something else? Now notice what it says about the ceremonial law. So let me read this again. God's people whom He calls His peculiar treasure were privileged with a twofold system of law, the moral and the ceremonial. The one pointing back to creation to keep in remembrance the living God who made the world, whose claims are binding upon all men in every dispensation, and which will exist through all time and eternity. The other, given because of man's transgression of the moral law, the obedience to which consisted in sacrifices and offerings, pointing to the future redemption. So what did this other one do? It points forward to future redemption. And it came to existence after sin. So when man sinned, that's when the ceremonial law came into existence. And what did it do? It pointed forward to future redemption. I'll read this next sentence here though. Each is clear and distinct from the other. So there's a clear distinction. There's a clear distinction between these two laws. They are not one and the same. There's a clear distinction between them. One points to creation, the other to future redemption. So when we are studying the Old Testament, when we're studying the whole Bible, when, when we find a law in that Bible, if it is pointing back to creation as a fundamental law from way back, then that is moral law. But if that law points to something in a future redemption that is ceremonial in nature, both of them had statutes and judgments. But those statutes that we are talking about here are those that are eternal in nature, that are in regards to the moral law. So, for example, the Passover. Does the Passover point to creation? Or does it point to some future redemption? It points to future redemption. Therefore, this is not the, the uh, statute that we're talking about of keeping in these last days. What about the Day of Atonement? What about the Feast of Tabernacles? What about any of those festivals? All the festivals point to something in the future redemption. And because it points to future redemption, it has nothing to do with what we are talking about here. No, we are not talking about keeping those things in these last days. No, we are talking only about those statutes and judgments that are in relationship to the moral law, that have it pointing back to creation, and that are eternal in their nature. 
the other given because of man's transgression of the moral law, the obedience to which consisted in sacrifices and offerings, pointing to the future redemption. Each is clear and distinct from the other. From the creation, the moral law was an essential part of God's divine plan and was an un as unchanging as himself. The ceremonial law was to answer a particular purpose in Christ's plan for the salvation of the race. The typical system of sacrifices and offerings was established that through these services, the sinner might discern the great offering, Christ. So the purpose of the ceremonial law was to be able to help people understand Jesus Christ. Now, what happens if we, in this dispensation, at the time of the New Testament, in after the crucifixion of Christ, if we then keep the ceremonial law? What happens then? I'm going to read from uh, Volume 5 Bible Commentary, page 1139-1140. Volume 5 Bible Commentary, 1139-1140. Speaking about the foot washing service, it says, This ordinance does not speak so largely to man's intellectual capacity as to his heart. His moral and spiritual nature needs it. If his disciples had not needed this, it would not have been left for them as Christ's last established ordinance in connection with and including the Last Supper. It was Christ's desire to leave to his disciples an ordinance that would do for them the very thing they needed that would serve to disentangle them from the rites and ceremonies which they had hitherto engaged in as essential, and which the reception of the gospel made no longer of any force. To continue these rites would be an insult to Jehovah. Notice this. They had up to this time considered these rites as essential. But after the cross, it is considered an insult to Jehovah. So if we continue that ceremonial law, those ceremonies associated with it, the feast days and other things, if we continue them in this side of the cross, we are actually insulting our Creator. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to insult my Creator. I want to have a good relationship with God. Now, sometimes when we speak about the statutes, we are not speaking about the specific thing in them. We are speaking about principles. And we'll explain a little bit more in detail some points like that when we study the subject entitled The Ribbon of Blue. But going on in Exodus chapter 15, verse 25 and 26. Exodus chapter 15, verses 25 and 26. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they came into the wilderness and God did something. Verse 25 and 26. And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. That's when they came to that bitter waters. The Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Notice here. He gave them there at that bitter water a statute when he performed that miracle. Now notice verse 26. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So, if they wanted to be free from the Egyptian diseases, what would they have to do? They had to keep all his statutes, and the laws that God had given to his people. Volume 1 Bible Commentary, page 1104. Volume 1 Bible Commentary, 1104. In consequence of continual transgression, the moral law was repeated in awful grandeur from Sinai. Christ gave the Moses religious precepts which were to govern everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. What? How long were they to last? How long are these statutes binding? And read it again. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. These commands were enforced by the power of the moral law and they clearly and definitely explained that law. 
another statement in Volume 7 Bible Commentary, page 984. Volume 7 Bible Commentary, 984. What happens when we proclaim the gospel? When we teach people the truth, what happens to them? The proclamation of the gospel is the only means in which God can employ human beings as in His instrumentalities for the salvation of souls. As men, women, and children, even children, as men, women, and children proclaim the gospel, the Lord will open the eyes of the blind to see His statutes and will write upon the hearts of the truly penitent His law. What will happen to them? As we preach the gospel, their eyes will be opened to understand His statutes. The animating Spirit of God working through human agencies leads the believers to be of one mind, one soul, unitedly loving God and keeping His commandments, preparing here below for translation. So, here below, as we learn about the statutes of God, the moral law statutes I'm talking about, as we keep those statutes, then we are preparing for translation. Now keep in mind, first of all we must consent to the truth, then we must fully live up to it, and then transmit it to others for that to be a benefit to us. And volume 2, Testament for the Church, 447. Volume 2, page 447. Many are not obeying the commandments of God, yet they profess so to do. If they would be faithful to obey all the statutes of God, they would have a power which would carry conviction to the hearts of the unbelieving. Do you want power? We often talk about the church needs power. Yes, what is the power of the church? The power of the church is found in what? First of all, in obeying all the statutes of God. It is only as we as a people obey all the statutes, all the definitions in the Word of God, all the statutes that are written here in the Bible and given to us also here in the Spirit of Prophecy, all these statutes, when we obey them, then that will be the thing that carries conviction to the hearts of the unbelieving. Now, among the Israelites, though, God also gave them some statutes that were no good. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 23 to 25. And in some of our later studies, we're going to especially emphasize these verses here a little bit clearer. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 23 through 25. I lifted up mine hand unto them also in the wilderness, that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries, because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live. So, there in the wilderness sojourn, God gave them certain statutes because they insisted on having it a certain way. But these statutes were not good. And well, like I said, we'll talk about them a little bit later. Now, among these statutes, there were certain types of laws included. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17. Leviticus chapter 3 and verse 17. There are certain types of statutes that were involved. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generation throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. Here we find that among the statutes that simplify the moral law, in other words, they are part of the moral law. They're no different than the moral law. And they included health laws. So according to this Bible verse, health laws are a part of the moral law of God. Now God then began to educate the Israelites in regard to the statutes regarding health. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, in chapter 15 we read, let's just read that verse 26 one more time. And if thou shalt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So these statutes resulted 
in no diseases. That must be something specifically about health. And for that reason, in chapter 16, just two verses later, God introduces them to the laws of health. And let us read a little bit about this. I'd like us to read verses 1 through 15. Let's read it all the way through first, and then we'll go back and emphasize points. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 15. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said, said unto all the children of Israel, At even then ye shall know that the Lord had brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. What are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he had heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. It is interesting, some points here that I'd like us to emphasize. In the first place, God gave them flesh. How long did God give them flesh? How long? It says here, only one day. It came in the evening, God gave them quail to eat. So He gave them flesh for one day. Now, what was the result? What was the result of eating flesh here? I know many times we get things confused. We think that many people died. In reality, not one person died as a result of eating quail here. Not one. No. It says here, the result, no one, no one died. They ate it one day, and no one died. And then in the morning, God gave them manna. And how long did God give them manna? It says here, Every, every day. They ended up spending 40 years eating the manna in the wilderness. And against whom were they murmuring? When they did murmur, who did they murmur against? Let us look at verse 8 again. Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So when they murmured, it was not against them, it was against the Lord. That was the problem with their murmurings. But they were not punished. It happened only for one day. And what did God do with the manna? Let's look at verses 31 through 35. Exodus 16, 31 to 35. 
And the house of Israel called the name there of manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Moses, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years. Until they came to the land inhabited, they did eat manna. Until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan, Mount Omer is a tenth part of an ephah. So they had manna every day. This every day was for 40 years. So for 40 years, they ate manna in the wilderness. That was the food that God gave to the children of Israel. Now, the flesh they had only for one day. And why was it that nothing happened to them on this particular occasion? Because God gave them this quail twice. Two times he gave them quail. One time here for one day, and there was no consequences. Now let us analyze why this happened. Let us analyze why is it that nothing happened to them on this particular occasion. Let's go back to Exodus 16 and verse 1. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departure out of the land of Egypt. When? On the 15th day of second month. When did they leave Egypt? They left Egypt on the 15th day of the first of the first month. So this was what? This was simply 30 days later. So 30 days after they left Egypt is when they decided to have quail. They murmured against God and God gave them quail. Look, they spent in Egypt quite a few years. They spent in Egypt how long? Uh, around a couple hundred years, 200 years or so, is the time that they spent in Egypt. I know some of you think about the 430 years, but that was the 430 years of sojourning and then 400 years of persecution and trials. But actually in Egypt, the slaves, well, somewhere around 200 years, maybe even less than that. So, but they were there, even 200 years, that's a long time. Okay, that's almost as long as the history of the United States here. So, what we find here is that after being so long in slavery, 30 days later, they decided to have meat. And God gave it to them for one day, but He began to educate them about the need for manna. Then we go on to Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month, in the second year, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel took their journey out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. So after these 30 days, they went to the wilderness of Sinai. In Mount Sinai, they learned all about the law of God. They spent almost one year learning about the law of God. And this is the second year... Notice here, when was it? It was the 20th day of the second month. So, you have here the 20th day of the second month. That's fully one year after the experience of quail. So they spent around one year on Mount Sinai learning about the law of God, learning the plan of salvation, learning what God had in store for His people and the type of lifestyle He wanted for them. It was after this that they again desired quail the second time. And we will see the consequences of that. But before we do that, let us take a look at one more statement. What happened? We read there in Exodus 16 that God had them take a pot of manna and place it before the law of God. And... 
Now we know that the law of God wasn't given at the same time as manna, but Exodus was written later on, so he explained what happened to them. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, it tells us exactly where that pot of manna was placed. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Notice here, wherein. What does wherein mean? Wherein means inside. So it says here, it talks about the, the ark of the covenant, and inside that ark was what? Was the pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the table of the stone. So in this context, wherever the table of the stone are, there is placed the pot of manna. Why is that? Is it because it's on an equal level with the law of God? Well, back to what we studied about earlier. What did we find out? Were the statutes equal with the law of God? Actually, the statutes were simply the law of God made in a manner easily to be understood by the people of God. That's all the statutes really were. But they were a part of the law of God. So, what was the result of the, when the people, after, no longer in ignorance, after one year of Bible studies, could you imagine having Bible studies every day? Right there looking on the mountain there of God and having Moses come down and explain the things of God. And not only that, but actually hearing God speak to us. Actually hearing the voice of God speak to us, the Ten Commandments. After all of that, then we come to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. It is, this is the second experience in regards to the quails. Numbers chapter 11 from verse 4 and onward. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us what? Who shall give us flesh to eat? Who's going to give us some flesh? We want flesh. So here, after one year of Bible studies, of clearly understanding the will of God, this is not just leaving Egypt or anything like that, but this is after one year of clearly understanding the will of God for His people, they come now into the wilderness. And what do they say? We want flesh. It is interesting how many people misunderstand the term flesh. How many times I say, well, I'm a vegetarian. And they tell me, oh, well, I'm a vegetarian too. I only eat chicken, eat chicken and fish. <laughs> what do we understand by the term flesh? And especially here when we talk about the flesh that the children of Israel asked for. So in verse 4, what did it say here? Again, who shall give us flesh to eat? Then verse 5, we remember the fish. Oh, what was the flesh? What kind of flesh? It was fish. That was the flesh that they were actually wanting in the wilderness. They were used to eating fish, and they wanted some more fish. And so when we talk about fish, clearly we're not talking about being a vegetarian and eating fish. Here the specific problem of eating flesh was eating the fish. Now we read on verse 5. We remember the fish which we did eat freely in Egypt the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Oh, well, they had those things too. They didn't just want the fish. Well, as we read on this chapter, we're going to find out that they soon forgot about the uh, melons and the cucumbers and the leeks and the onions and garlic. They didn't mention them again. Let's see, what was their real desire? These were only things that helped spice up the fish. Let's look on. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. This is all we have is this manna. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was the color of the delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills, or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. 
And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep through their families. Every man at the door of his tent and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. What were they doing? They were standing in front of their doors of their tent. They were standing up there and they were weeping and crying for what? Verse 11, And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say to me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? What were they standing in the door for? Crying for cucumbers? Crying, we want some melons? Is that what they were doing? No. They said, when shall I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. If thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of, the, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourself against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you flesh and you shall eat. They were saying, oh, it was wonderful for us in Egypt. Can you believe it? They forgot about how bad it was in slavery. So easily to forget. Oh, we had such a good time in Egypt. We had a lot of fish. We could eat all the fish we wanted. And now we have no fish. We want flesh. And God says, okay, you want flesh? I will give you flesh. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days. But even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? What are they doing? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? We want flesh. We'd rather be back in Egypt than we can have our flesh. And the Lord says, Okay, you want flesh? We'll give you plenty of it. And Moses says, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herd be slain for them, to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? How is this possible? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand wax short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And so, as they were complaining about flesh, God says, Okay, we will give you plenty of flesh. But you are going to get it for one whole month. But what was the result? Let's go drop down to verse 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails. He that gathered leaf, least gathered ten omers and they spread themselves all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibrath Hatava, because there they buried the people that lusted. Can you believe this? This time they began eating their flesh. They wanted flesh? Yeah, have it. God says, you insist on having what you want. Have it. But as they were eating that flesh, before it was even chewed, they began to die. I am sure that if I were to eat flesh, I am sure that I would have some severe consequences. I have not eaten flesh all my life. And so for me to put flesh in my body at this time would probably have some consequences. But those consequences not, would not be while well, it's still in my mouth. 
those consequences will be once it's inside my stomach and it begins to metabolize. But here it shows that this was clearly God's displeasure. As soon as it came to their mouth, they began to die. God sent them a plague. Now, why did God send them a plague? What was the reason? Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see, in the time of ignorance, God closed His eyes. But now, when our eyes were opened with truth, then God calls for repentance. And among the children of Israel, what happened to them? They were there in the wilderness the first time after 30 days. God understood that they were still in ignorance. Then He took them to Mount Sinai. He educated them for one year. Then they came out of Sinai. And again, the first thing they say, we want meat. Well, now it was no longer ignorance. Now it is called full-fledged rebellion. For this reason, in Patriarchs from Prophets, page 79. Patriarchs from Prophets, page 79. Murmurings and tumults had been frequent during the journey from the Red Sea to Sinai. But in pity for their ignorance and blindness, God had not then visited the sin with judgments. But since that time he had revealed himself to them at Horeb. They had received great light as they had been witnesses to the majesty, the power and the mercy of God. And their unbelief and discontent incurred a greater guilt. Furthermore, they had covenanted to accept Jehovah as their king and to obey his authority. They, their murmuring was now rebellion. And as such, it must receive prompt and signal punishment if Israel was to be preserved from anarchy and ruin. The fire of Jehovah burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. The most guilty of the complainers were slain by lightning from the cloud. So as soon as they tasted that meat, lightning came from the cloud and killed them. Because this was now rebellion. And so it is with you and me. There are many things that God has revealed to us. In our ignorance, God tolerated it. God allowed us to experience those things. But once we came to the knowledge of truth clearly, and then we reject the truth, then it is called rebellion. And then we suffer the consequences. For this reason, as the psalmist in Psalm chapter 78, verses 17 through 31 was as he is explaining or repeating this history, what is this desire for flesh here called? Psalm 78, starting with verse 17. Notice what it says. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. What did they do? They sinned. And what did they do? They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, He smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can He give bread also? Can He provide flesh for His people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation. Though He had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down bread upon them to eat, and had given them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens. By his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and feathered fowl like as the sand of the sea. He let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their habitations. So they did eat, and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust. But while the meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Those who gorged themselves, they were smitten first. For all this, they sinned still and believed not for His wondrous works. They still did not believe in God and they continued sinning. So, before we move on a little bit further here, I want to just summarize a couple of these points here. First of all, when the children of Israel went into the wilderness, God gave them His desired food. For 40 years, it was manna. 
It was not flesh. It was a non-flesh diet. And to explain to them and to remind them from, for all other ages that God's desire for His people was to eat non-flesh foods, He placed the pot of manna into the ark. It is only when they insisted on having flesh that God gave it to them for a little while and they suffered the consequences. But you know, the children of Israel were not happy with his non-flesh diet. For 40 years they murmured and complained in the wilderness. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, later on God explained what he was trying to tell the Israelites all the time. From that time all the way until the, they ceased to be a nation, God kept telling them something important. Jeremiah 6, 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. God says, Do you want rest unto your soul? Do you want happiness? Do you want joy? There is only one way, and that is to follow in the old paths. But the rest of the verse says the sad ending of that people. But they said, we will not walk therein. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 284. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 284. In this instance, the Lord gave the people that which was not for their best good, because they would have it. They would not submit to receive from the Lord only those things which would prove for their good. They gave themselves up to seditious murmurings against Moses and against the Lord because they did not receive those things which would prove an injury to them. Their depraved appetites controlled them and God gave them flesh meats as they desired and let them suffer the result of gratifying their lustful appetites. Burning fevers cut down very large numbers of the people. Those who had been the most guilty in their murmurings were slain as soon as they tasted the meat for which they had lusted. If they had submitted to have the Lord select their food for them, and had been thankful and satisfied with food for which they could eat freely without injury, they would not have lost the favor of God and then been punished for their rebellious murmurings by great numbers of them being slain. Volume 2, Selected Messages 412. But the Hebrews were not satisfied. They despised the food given them from heaven and wished themselves back in Egypt where they could sit by the flesh pots. They preferred slavery and even death rather than to be deprived of meat. God in His anger gave them flesh to gratify their lustful appetites and great numbers of them died while eating the meat for which they had lusted. In times we study with somebody and they say, Oh no! I would rather die than not go, and not go to heaven than to miss out on meat. Well, that's what the Israelites said. They'd rather go back to Egypt. I have a question for you. You want to go to Egypt? Or do you want to go to the promised land? Shall we go up and possess the land? It's a decision that we need to make. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we find that as a result of their continual refusal to eat a non-flesh diet, that God gave them a statute that was not good. That's right, a bad statute. Let's read it. Deuteronomy 12, verse 20. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 20. When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh, Thou mayest eat flesh whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. When you come to the promised land and you enjoy the land and you said, I want meat, go ahead. Go ahead and eat your meat. But what does God call it here? He calls it lust. And what is lust? Romans 7, 7. It is the violation of the law of God. So God says, go ahead, but he still called it sin. Therefore, when we read verse 20, we find that God did not intend them to eat flesh when they entered the promised land. He intended that them remain on vegetarian diet. But when they insisted on flesh food, he said, go ahead and have it. But then in chapter 14, he gave them some restrictions. He told them only to eat the clean meats. He never gave them even permission for unclean. He said, then at least have only the clean meats. But God's plan, this whole issue of clean and unclean meats, all that was given because the Israelites refused 
to fulfill God's plan. Ministry of Healing, page 311. Ministry of Healing, page 311. In choosing man's food in Eden, the Lord showed what was the best diet. In the choice made for Israel, he taught the same lesson. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt and undertook their training, that they might be a people for his own possession. Through them he desired to bless and teach the world. He provided them with food best adapted for this purpose, not flesh, but manna, the bread of heaven. It was only because of discontent and their murmurings for the flesh pots of Egypt that animal food was granted them, and this only for a short time. Its use brought disease and death to thousands. Yet, now listen to this, yet the restriction to a non-flesh diet was never heartily accepted. It continued to be the cause of discontent and murmuring, open or secret, and was not made permanent. Why did, not God, why did God not make it permanent? Because they kept murmuring and complaining, we want flesh. They never accepted the vegetarian diet from their heart. Because they did not accept it from their heart, it was not made permanent. And of course their consequences were they could not be fulfill God's plan for them. Now what to do with the pot of manna then? If the pot of manna in the ark symbolizes that vegetarian diet, the non-flesh diet, then how can you carry a symbol that did not have a real meaning? Well, let's take a look in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 10. Solomon built a temple, and they brought the ark inside that temple. What was inside the ark at that time? 2 Chronicles chapter 5, and verse 10. There was nothing in the ark, save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Notice the wording. There was nothing in the ark except the Ten Commandments. What does that mean? That means something was in the ark. What was in the ark? The pot of manna was in the ark. Aaron's rod was in the ark as we read there in Hebrews. And because Israel rejected these two things is why they were no longer kept in the ark. You see, God is not playing games. He gives us something. You reject it, you don't want it, He's going to take it away. And then finally, they rejected the pot of manna first. Then they rejected Aaron's rod. And then they rejected the whole Ten Commandments. They rejected the whole thing. And when they rejected the whole thing, what happened then? What was the purpose of the ark? You take out the pot of manna, you take out Aaron's rod, then what's He going to do? Take out the Ten Commandments too? Well, God did something else. Let's look at Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, page 414. Volume 1, page 414. Because of the sins of Israel, the calamity which God said should come upon the temple if His people departed from Him was fulfilled some hundreds of years after the temple was built. God promised Solomon if he would remain faithful and his people would obey all his commandments, that glorious temple should stand forever in all its splendor as an evidence of the prosperity and exalted blessings resting upon Israel for their obedience. You see, God's plan was that that temple would be forever. Forever it was to remain there throughout all eternal ages. But only if they obeyed. Because of Israel's transgression of the commandments of God and their wicked acts, God suffered them to go into captivity to humble and punish them. Before the temple was destroyed, God made known to a few of His faithful servants the fate of the temple, which was the pride of Israel and which they regarded with idolatry while they were sinning against God. They took this big temple and they looked at that temple. Oh, it was a lovely temple. They began to worship that temple. And they forgot what the purpose of it was. These righteous men, just before the destruction of the temple, removed that sacred ark containing the tables of stone, and with mourning and sadness, secreted it in a cave where it was to be hid from the people of Israel because of their sins, and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hid, it has never been disturbed since it was secreted. 
Notice here, they rejected the pot of manna. God took it away. They rejected Aaron's rod. God took it away. When they finally rejected the law of God, God took the entire ark away. And when that temple was rebuilt in the most holy place, there was no ark. It was hidden, and it is hidden till today. But we were studied earlier that there are important lessons for us. Those of us who are living in these last days, those of us who are about to enter the heavenly Canaan. What lessons are there for us? Especially on the point of health reform. What about the pot of manna? What happened to the pot of manna? Where did God take it? What happened to Aaron's rod? Where did God take that? What about the people today? Do we have an ark today? All these questions we're going to answer in our next study. May the Lord help each one of you. As you study through these points, go back over some of these references. Read them. Study them for yourself. And remember, we are not here to cast stones on Israel. We are here to learn how we may go up and possess the land. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Consider the lilies, consider the lilies. They toil not, neither do they spin. They toil not, they toil not, they toil not, neither do they spin. Which today is in the field, which today is in the field. How much more will we put? How much more will we put? Fuel ye of little faith. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Consider the lilies, consider the lilies, they toil not, neither do they spin. They toil not, they 